In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands for victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Jesus, I've forgotten the words that you have spoken. Promises that burned within my heart have now grown dim. With a doubting heart I follow the paths of earthly wisdom. Forgive me for my unbelief, renew the fire again. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy on me. I have built an altar. Where I've worshipped things of man I have taken journeys that have drawn me far from you Now I am returning to your mercies ever flowing Pardon my transgressions, help me love you again Lord, have mercy Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy on me, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy on me. to know you, 
And all your tender mercies Like a river of forgiveness Ever flowing without end So I bow my heart before you In the goodness of your presence Your grace forever shining like a beacon in the night Lord have mercy Christ have mercy Lord have mercy on me Lord have mercy Christ have mercy Our God is a consuming fire, burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the holy righteous judge, ruling over us with kindness and wisdom, and we will keep our eyes. Fortress is our God, a sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign. Our God is jealous for his own. None could comprehend His love and His mercy. Our God is exalted on His throne, high above the heavens, forever He's worthy, and we will keep our eyes on You. We will keep our Fortress is our God, a sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign, so we will set our hearts on. We will set our hearts on you. A mighty fortress is our God. A sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is unshakable. With you forever we will reign. With you forever we will reign. Our God is a consuming fire. Live in our hearts, fill this body. Stir our spirits, help us serve. Walk with our feet to the hurting. Let us be you, revive your church. Let us be you on this earth. Let us be you when a wounded soul cries out for be you when the lonely need to know they're not alone just as 
as your stars pierce through the night. Let us forever shine your light. Let us be you. Let us be you. On this earth, reach with our hands, touch this city. Lord, let our mouths speak your truth. Use our blessings to bring justice. Let us be you. Revive your church. Let us be you on this earth. Let us be you when a wounded soul cries out for hope. Let us be you. Just as your stars pierce through the night, let us forever shine your light. Let us be you, let us be you on this earth. Let us be you. to the table and worship the Savior, taste what forgiveness is for. His mercy will lead us, the grace of God feed us, making us hungry for more. His body was given for you and for me. Look on the cross and believe. The bread has been broken, our eyes have been opened. Oh, come, Lord, restore and renew, your word has been spoken, so humbled and broken. We do all in remembrance of you. The bread has been broken, and all those who know him believe without touching the scar. His death reconciled us, we live sanctified to become what we already are. To him who loves us and freed us to love, be glory and honor and praise. The bread has been broken, our eyes have been opened. Oh, come, Lord, restore and renew, your word has been spoken, so humbled and broken. We do all in remembrance of you. The bread has been broken. Bread has been broken. Our eyes have been opened. Eyes have been opened. Oh, come, Lord, restore and renew. Your word has been spoken. Word has been spoken. So humbled and broken. Humbled and broken. We do all in remembrance of you. The bread has been broken. Good morning. Good morning. Come on in and find a seat. Good morning. Here we go. There we go. Get some lights flickering. Now we'll get your attention. All right, good morning. We are glad you're here this morning. Come on in and find your seat, and we will get started. I hope you're ready to worship our God with me. Um, for those of you in person, it is great to see you. For those online, we miss you. Um, but we are glad that you are here and joining us this morning. We do have a couple of announcements I want to cover. 
Uh, first one, make sure you're recording your attendance. You can scan this code, so get your camera out. I won't think you're taking a picture of me, it's okay. You can point it up here at the screen, tap on it and register your attendance. You can also go to the Realm app if you have that, or if you get the bulletin each week, there's a code in there that you can scan as well. But let us know that you're here, and especially if you're a visitor, so that we can uh, reach out and meet you and send you some information about Saturn Road. Next, we are trying to update Realm. If you're not familiar with what Realm is, it's basically our online directory. You can also do your online giving there. It has a lot of information about Saturn Road. Go to Realm, and if you, uh, in the little search bar in the top, click on your name. If the information isn't right, let the church office know. Let us get that updated. Your cell phone's in there. Your email is in there. That email is also used to send out the love line each week as well as our bulletin. So let's make sure that that's uh, updated and accurate. And if there's not a picture in there, you can send a picture to the church office. It does not have to be the standard church picture in front of the little stone wall. It can be a Christmas card. It can be a birthday card. It can be something even more exciting. Let's keep it PG. Um, but send a picture in. If, uh, you know, when we're looking at other people up online, if you hear a name, it's like, I'm not sure who that is. It's great to be able to click on that and see their picture. So send those in. Next, uh, Fifth Sunday Singing. This, uh, this month has five Sundays in it, so our fifth Sunday will be the 31st, and that evening at 6 p.m. we will have a singing service here uh, in the auditorium, so make plans to join us for that. And then the last announcement, we have a, a new family placing membership, the Tuttle family. Yes, thank you. And are they here this morning? I don't see, oh, here they are, right over here. Perfect. So welcome. We're glad you're joining us. All right, let's prepare for worship. Paul, you got it. Well, he was talking about those pictures. I thought of all those awkward Christmas photos that we took over the years. I thought, why not? Let's just put it up there. When the elders are looking, it's like, oh, okay. I guess we'll put them on our prayer list. Hey, we are in for a great treat this morning. We're going to be talking about uh, food, the bread of life, and I'm so excited, and I love some energy, so let's stand up. Ladies, you're going to start us off here really strong. I'm pressing, and men will come in. This is, uh, we haven't done this in a while but I think it'll just click right back in. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I've gained every day. Still praying high, downward bound. Lord, clap my feet higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on the stable land, a higher land. That I have found, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where the mountain is a fierce dismay. Twice as loud. Twice. And then when you come in, boom it. And I need the youth section. Boom it loud. Here we go. Let's go back to the very beginning. I want to try this one more time. All right. Here we go. And ladies, sing it out with all your voice this morning. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, let me up and let me stand. I live on heaven, the stable land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has
Good morning. I love this energy. Good morning. Yeah, let's, we're going to go to the scripture. Thank you. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's time to listen to him. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, this morning, Robbie is going to be talking to us about food and what that means in our life. And when I was preparing for this, this I came upon a scripture and it just spoke to me a lot. Uh, let's read this together. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service Others will praise God for the generosity and sharing. We serve an awesome God, and we're overflowing in praise and thanksgiving. Let's sing this with all our heart to our Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Lord, give us the name with our soul, our soul.
salvation. You don't have to worry about it. God has given us full salvation. Let's go to the part that helps us with this name of Jesus. We think about his body, we think about his life. Use this song to help us. As we come to the table this morning, Robbie and I would like to invite our newest member, baptized Emmy Hoddle, to join us at the table, and one of our more seasoned members, Laurel Blackburn. Please join us at the table. I miss this. When we have sanitized communion, we lose this Passover style fellowship that the early church originally had. It's so good to feel that family connection, even if it's with just a few of us here at the table this morning, breaking bread together. In John 6, we find Jesus who just fed the 5,000 and ministered to them. The story is a staple of children's ministry. Children learn it from an early age. I remember my little brother hearing it at three years old. When the teacher told the story and asked review questions, she was hoping to guide the kids in a discussion of miracles. So she asked, when Jesus fed the 5,000 and there were 12 baskets and everyone was so full, what do we call that? We call it a mmm. My little brother raised his hand and said, when that happens at our house, we call it leftovers. <laughs> After the feeding of the 5,000, with all those leftovers, he joins the disciples on a boat by walking on the water to them. After the feeding of the 5,000, he joins the disciples on the boat by walking on the water to them. These are huge miracles, huge important stories. And then we get to verse 24. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You were looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what, was, what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? Now remember, he fed the 5,000. He walked on water to the boat. And they say, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the man in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It's not Moses who's given you bread from heaven but it's my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. 
Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Let's pray. We give you thanks for being our bread and our sustenance. And as we gather at this table with our brethren, we thank you for the opportunity for fellowship and for the invitation, for your sacrifice, and for the salvation and the life together that proceeds out of that commitment to ones that you have created. Pray for this bread. Pray that as we receive it as a community, it will strengthen us both spiritually and give us resolve to go out and be the bread of life in your stead for others. For Christ, let me pray. Pray thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me, as thou didst bless the Pray for the cup. Let the bread be broken and taken in and let the blood run free. As in the Old Testament, the blood represented life. And we thank you, Lord, for giving your blood that life that keeps on giving us life. And as we take part of this drink, we remember that you sustain us, giving us bread for life and life abundant. For Christ, let me pray and we thank you. Amen. I love you, Lord, and I Let's pray for the collection. Father in heaven, as we pass these baskets around for our contribution, we're not passing to give out of our leftovers, but out of our first fruits. Just as with the feeding of the 5,000, we ask you to take our small, meager offering, our dollars, our nickels, our dimes, and perform a miracle with it too. God, more than that, we, as we give, perform a miracle and change our hearts. Fill our hearts with overflowing as we give in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey everybody, my name is Kate Barnes and I'm the Care Play Read Director for those of you who don't know me. This time of year is my favorite because we get to send our kids to Camp Goddard with Children's Ministry and it's just so fun and they love it and we can't do any of that without y'all's help. So during this next song, if you'd like to, please feel free to come down to the front, grab an envelope, and then come either find me with a donation in that at the information desk or you can give online as well and there'll be an email sent about that. Thank you so much. This year, Hooked on Jesus, got some stories about fishing water at Camp Goddard. I was very blessed at the, right at the start of CPR to come up here and to see Kate in action. It's amazing. It's a blessing. It's a ministry, if you're not familiar with it, back in 1992 is when this all began. We began outreaching to our community and bringing the children in. I was blessed to get to join with Mary Dooley and Carol Phelps as we kind of did this, and I had many helpers, Holly Harden, Amy Bacon, many people who have participated over the years, but this is our chance to really do a concrete thing to reach out to these people and let them know that God loves them and wants them to be a part of his forever family. What I'm going to ask you to do is that some of these kids have some means to pay for things, but a lot of them do not. And up at the front, we have a couple of baskets with envelopes. And I, if you are moved, if God, if the Spirit is moving you to help out in this endeavor, we're going to sing a song here, and I would like for you, we're going to stand up, and when you can come forward, grab an envelope, decide how much you can contribute to help these kids go to camp, and then uh, you can, there's a place out in the Family Center, you'll be able to drop that off. And I really hope you choose to be a part of this because it is something that you can immediately have an effect on. So let's stand together and let's sing it. We're going to sing two verses of this, and you can come down and pick up an envelope. I love you, Lord, and I live my voice to worship.
singing me happy today. And the church said, yeah. see church. Good morning, online and on ground. Welcome to a gathering of the body of Christ here at Saturn Road. Before I get started, I have a quick PSA. You all feeling all right today? Everybody good? Yeah, all right, all right, all right, all right. This morning we're talking about food, food for thought. But before we get there, we have seen that um, the Roe versus Wade ruling have been publicized and talked about, and um, the terms pro-life and pro-choice are very much politically charged terms. And so when people use those terms, they surmise that everyone else knows what they mean by those terms. That's not the case. And so you guys are blessed with elders filled with wisdom wanting to lead with the Spirit. And so they have proposed that we discuss the idea of pro-life and pro-choice at a congregational meeting that will give you guys a few times to choose so that we could come together as a body, as a family, and not just give a 20-second sound bite or a 15-minute monologue sermon on this everyday issue that people are struggling with, but to really come together and lay it all out and understand that God and Christ is concerned for life both in the womb and out of the womb. So stay tuned for that announcement. We will be reconvening and talking about this episode of life that is playing out now, that is dividing churches and families and people. And um, the leadership here wants to make sure that as we talk about everyday things, we don't just talk about it for 20 seconds and <sighs> shout our truth and leave. We want to really walk with people every day and figure this thing out. So that is coming soon. On today, we are talking about food for thought. There's really nothing to see here. Is that the video? There we go. Should I click? Okay, all right. Here we go. There's nothing to see here, as I said. No earth shattering truths. We were a family. We got a Just food. That's what I love about chicken and rice with sauce on the side. Watermelon slightly cut up so that we don't choke on the water and the pulp. Oranges ripe and fresh, beef stew, leg of lamb, barbecue brisket, cabbages, tortillas, rice krispies, Big Mac sandwiches, curly fries, dumplings, and hot pockets. Just, just food. There's nothing to see here. So, preacher, please tell me a story about Jesus. A Sunday sermon about the gospel, and so on Sundays, we want to hear words like uh, sanctification, saving grace, sacrifice, you know, those good Sunday pious words, but not food. How do you preach a sermon on food? 
We just do that every day and take it for granted. We preach important things, but not food. And I will tell you, believe it or not, food is involved. Now, if you're not reading your Bible upside down or separating the images and metaphors from the words of Christ in red or the critical pen of the prophet, you are going to see a whole lot of eating going on. Thank you. So in 2010, the U.S. Census Bureau reported that 15.1% of people lived below the poverty line. And in that same year, the World Food Organization says that there were 925 million people worldwide that were simply hungry. In a world where we waste 30 to 50 percent of food produced. And in between this aspect of hunger and poverty, we have everyday people eating to forget about their troubles. Some eat to create good memories or to remember good memories. Some eat to celebrate. Some just eat to, ah, alas, survive. Everyday people are eating. Christians are eating. But without understanding. The foundations of food show up in the Old Testament. And so in Genesis 1, from verse 29, we have these words. And God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. So seedless grapes, by the way. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. We are talking about food. God gave food in the beginning. And he says, man, this is good. Not just good. God saw all that he had made. And it was it was very good. But we're not talking about sacrifice and sanctification. We're talking about food. So God made food initially defined by fruit trees and such, and he called them good. Good food. Even after the fall and the sweat of thy brow production clause you know, came into being, Good food was still cultivated and grown, and animals were raised to be brought forth to table so that they could nourish themselves. Now, now, hold on there. God did not have to make our bodies to require food. But he did, and he gave us good food, not just to eat and to live, but get this. To enjoy. Do you think chefs trained for years so that they could just cook things that you could just survive on? No. There is an explosion in your mouth based on where you eat, you know, your, your, your chef meals. And it reminds you of the goodness of life, the goodness of what God has created. So in the Old Testament sacrificial system of things, the animals are brought and God said, hey, 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 don't bring any blemished animals around here. No, no broken wing fowl and no broken leg lamb. Bring the best food that you have. The animals that you know by name, free roaming, not cooped up in a shed with minimal movement and light. Bring them, I want sacrifice to rise to the heavens and the priest would eat the rest the good food good worthy sacrifices burned and eaten nothing wasted in the push and pull of communion with god blessing from god providence for the priests and the people 
Food is love, food is providence, food is communication, an item in worship. And the Israelites are wandering in the wilderness, and they're singing the song, It's raining tacos. No. Manna. He says, I will rain down manna from heaven. And interestingly, they gathered meat in the evening and bread in the morning. Food coming down from heaven. Do not miss this. God is a foodie, but not how you expect and so what blows my mind is as I'm sitting at a table with Ryan and our, and our lovely sisters, I have no idea that he's unpacking John chapter 6. I was like, did you read my notes last night? John chapter 6, we go back into John chapter 6. Verse 3 says, then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Passover meals, meats are being roasted. People are eating. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of bread. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish. But how far will they go among so many? Now, I'm not going to give it away yet, but the next few words is going to rock your world. Maybe not now, but in a few moments. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. Some of you are going like, I don't see anything in there. Just hold on a second. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down. Exodus 6, it's raining something. Jesus is in the midst, and he's talking about bread coming down. This is exciting, right? No? It doesn't look so, but we go on. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this food, this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus speaks of relationship between God and man using food. Yes. Modernity has cut us loose from our relationship to food, which in turn blows our eyes from realizing the significance and the ways food points back to God and forward to the return of Christ. In the ancient Near East, particularly Mesopotamia, people would feed the gods. Hey, we need to get some bread and some grapes. We need to go feed the gods. Feed the gods because they need us. And then you get to Exodus chapter number 16. And people are not feeding the gods. But God is feeding the people. Look at here. What about a role rehearsal? God is feeding the people. Hmm. Let's chew on that for a little bit. Why? What is food? I have three questions before we get deeper into the text. Number one. 
No lunch after this. I'll be good to go. Is food on awareness and oppression? We are so removed from the production of our food that there are some kids who don't know that eggs come from... Well, well do you guys know where eggs come from? I don't know, because that answer wasn't so confident. Or, when you go to the grocery store, that the well-lit grocery aisles with attractively packaged foods, that there's a story about the animal and how it lives and how it died, that there's a story about the vegetables and the fruits, veggie tails, if you will, whether they are produced on a farm or whether they are produced by people who are employed, but they don't get a fair wage, or whether they are produced on land that's destroyed by pesticides to secure, <clears throat> to secure large yields at the consequence of toxic runoff, fair wages, fair labor practices, considerations by Jane Webster as she speaks on a theology of food. People today are unaware eaters. Israelites eating in the wilderness. How can you not be aware that your food is falling from the sky? Sacrifice that the priests are giving as it goes up to God in this temple and they're eating the rest. How can they be unaware that they are in God's presence? The prayer for our daily bread as the man of miracle is in our midst. How can you be unaware of your bread? Awareness of the food, where it comes from, and the significance of it all is crucial. So Raj Patel from Food Inc., Hungry for Change says, today's global food system undermines human health mistreats food service and agricultural workers, destroys agricultural communities, abuses animals and degrades agricultural lands and ecosystems. Is, is this a sermon? Yes. In the beginning, God gave food as an expression of provision and enjoyment. Said it was good when he made it. Today it is far from good and not always healthy and so on. So who broke Food. Sometimes we like the food of others, but we hate them and their culture that they represent. Is food exploitation? Do you know the tale of the sugar plantations in Florida? How the typical chicken lives? What is comfort food we eat to feel something in our souls? It is the same way shopping to feel it and buying to feel it, to feel something deeper. Ah! We eating unaware is food on awareness is food oppression. Second question is is food bad? So God made good food to replicate. We seeking to duplicate, make a lot of bad food because it is not with the intention of fellowship or feeding the hungry, but for profit. And so fast food reflects. Or relationships. Have you ever thought about that? Fast food. The modern day convenience. No, I'm not the pot calling the kettle black. You know, sometimes I eat from these places. But I want to preach truth to myself. And invite us in to reflect. Is that okay? So don't go and pick it against pizza and those places. We're just taking one step forward to understand our relationship with food. Because everyday people are eating food every day. Day, fast food reflects our relationship. Convenience, timed, quick, abundant, but not so nutritious or nourishing. Unhealthy, mindless, attractive, but toxic. Slow food production is not something that fits well into our society. And so there's urban food Deserts where poor people have limited options for food. So we go to all these to shop. We go to Walmart to shop for food and Target. But some people walk across to the convenience store or gas station to buy bread, to buy milk, and other things usually highly 
processed. A lot of food production is occurring where animals are crammed up in tight spaces or abused. And I wonder the stress that these animals face. I wonder as we eat the food of these animals, I wonder if that stress transfers to us. I guess not, right? So we have these stickers, free range. You buy your eggs, it means, what's, what's free range? Not cooped up. Some people like to have free range meat because the animal is, you know, eating and, you know, drinking and it's like, you know, little horse on the prairie, they're running down and they're doing this and that. They're free and they, are, they feel pretty good. So when you eat that meat, maybe it's better. I don't know. Is food, is food bad? Is food commodity with consumerism? A consumerist approach to food. Throw away the leftovers, buy what you don't need, not your daily bread, overstocked fridges and pantries, things getting thrown away due to frostbite and unused. Maybe eating at a closed table. This is for me and mine, like Smeagol. My precious, this is for me and mine. Closed tables at houses, closed tables at churches. This is a reflection of our Christianity sometimes. Consumer mentality. What do you have for me, church? How can this church give me, bless me instead of what can I sacrifice to feed the body spiritually which feeds me as well? Maybe we need a worshipful attitude towards food. And so the service industry indicates that we feel ourselves above the need to work directly for our own nurturing as Eric Schlosser says, food is commodity, food is volume, efficiency, profit, food is production. But what does the Bible tell us about food? What does John chapter 6 indicate about food? Food is communication, food is community. It reveals what we believe about people, ourselves, our bodies, our time, money, and places. We don't have time to think about where food comes from or under what conditions they are made available. Food communicates. It communicates trust. And so all the missionaries in here seated you understand as you traveled abroad that as you entered houses and huts and homes and they brought things like, you know, fufu and things you didn't recognize, you could not say, well, um, do you have any Big Macs or, you know, do you have any Starbucks or, or whatever you like, you know? No! In order for it to succeed as a missionary, to have some sort of a equity relationally, you had to bless it and eat. Or else you were out of here. So ask the folks who have gone to India and Chile and Brazil, and they will tell you, when somebody invites you and shares the food with you, you pray to God that you're going to be all right, and you eat. Because food communicates trust. I was not in the back kitchen when they were preparing those things. I don't know what they put in there. No, I'm not trying to scare you guys. <laughs> I don't know what they put in there, but I think if you're like me, you've survived a bunch of potlucks where people from all over church brought stuff and you were okay. Nobody got food poisoning from potlucks, right? Don't say anything if you did. <laughs> food communicates trust. Sharing food with others defines community. So slaves did not eat with the rich. They would do their work, prepare meals, and they would scurry off to eat their bread in a corner somewhere while the folks at, at a table. So Jesus and his disciples come along the way, and they are redefining the traditional understanding of community. At the redefining of community, there was a big old table with food on it. Could you imagine that? No sort of a big miracle or mind-blowing thing. It was just simply good food that God had created from the beginning. The new community is scandalous because they are eating with 
tax collectors and sinners. So Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He. For the Lord he wanted to. Then as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, yo, man, come down, bro. I'm going to your house. What do you think that they're going to do? Play Uno or card money? They're going to eat. And people were outraged. How dare, how dare you use this sacred thing about having meals with people we know and love to extend it to a tax collector, a sinner. And as they're going on, man, he's redefining community with Bread. It's like Simba being held up. Bread. This is so wild. Bread. He's breaking bread and he's sharing and he's redefining community. So Samuels wrote a book called God's Companions Reimagining Christian Ethics says the hospitality with which God founds and daily renews the world is to be extended through Christian communities that eat with everyone and anyone. I remember spending two years in a dorm with a bunch of rowdy young guys like myself and an older guy, his last name was Crawford. Crawford spent nine years in a Canadian prison because he had killed somebody during a tussle. And my bunk and my brother, my brother was right here and somebody was below him. The person below him was Crawford. And my bunk was right there about two and a half feet from Crawford. And in that dormitory, you had all these young guys, a bunch of young boys guilty of the loss of the flesh and the loss of the eyes and the pride of life. Even those in a sense can be murderous to the soul. We had meals with Crawford was a changed man. Have you ever shared a room with a murderer? As intriguing as it sounds, he was one of the best guys that I knew to this day. Because whatever circumstance led him to take the life of that person with a knife, did his prison time and he came out sought God, got converted, and is still now preaching the gospel. Several of Jesus' parables describe a banquet where a host invites the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. The sharing of the food, the fellowship meals, grew the community of faith. Acts chapter 2, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord. Let me, let me, let me rephrase this for you. While they were eating with people, while they were inviting people to eat, God was adding to the church. We're talking about food, yes? Yes. While they were eating with people, finding favor because they were having community meals and sharing food. God adds to the church. So in John 21, we have food being not just providence and communication, but also sacrifice. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Oh, yes, you know I love you. All right, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs, equating feeding with loving. Feeding to the point of self-sacrifice. Describing what Peter would end up doing for the lambs. He would give his life. Jesus turns water into wine, feeds 5,000 you know, raises again, serves his disciples, breakfast. But he must die to feed the world like the Passover lamb slaughtered. Jesus offers himself as the bread that came down. So back to our scripture. Jesus said, um, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass. Do you know what that is? That is a natural table. This is a symbol. All right? A table is nothing. It is just a gathering place for community, a placeholder for the bread. Jesus says, sit them down. There's plenty of grass in that place. And they sat them down. And then he what? He did what Ryan did. He took bread and he broke it. Have you ever seen that somewhere? 
He took bread and he broke it and then he just ate. No. He gave thanks. We just did that. He gave thanks and then he gave it to them and everybody could eat as much as they wanted. So when Jesus blessed that bread and he shared it, it filled everyone. Five loaves and two fish. It filled every one. So hold that image in your mind. And let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. I usually don't jump around with scripture, but this is about food. And this actually goes along with what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse 31. Paul says, what are you eating or drinking? You can bring God glory. Before we get to verse chapter 11, Paul says in chapter 10, what are you eating or drinking? You can actually bring God glory. Our actions will follow from what we believe. And whatever you believe about God can be illustrated in your eating and your drinking. So Paul says, whenever... Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. You see that? You see that? You can say yes. Thank you. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you are falling asleep. For years, I heard people say, well, you know, when you come to the Lord's Supper, you have to examine yourself and eat in a worthy manner. Newsflash, none of us are worthy. This is not talking about you. It's talking about the other person. Let me make it plain for you. There was what you called a love feast or a fellowship meal. And if you go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, People are coming together, and some are drunk. Some have eaten to the point that when others come in, they are ashamed because there's nothing to eat. Because the Lord's Supper, the unleavened bread and the wine, was couched in a fellowship meal. And so Paul says, you people have houses to eat. You guys have means. You guys can eat your food at home, but no, you come here and you eat all the food and you drink all the wine. And when folks who are in need come, they can't get nothing. You have put them to shame. So the person that eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks without, without respect or appreciation or providing space for the other person. It has nothing to do with you. And, oh man, I sinned on Friday night. I sinned on Saturday night. I got to make sure I pray so that I can come and take this thing in a worthy manner. It's not about you. It was never about you. It was always about the next person at table with you that you were shaming because you did not think about them while you ate. Corinthians missed the point of Jesus' death when they ate eating away that dishonored the Lord's table an unworthy manner because they did not consider each other. Eating with awareness builds community. Eating without awareness divides community. But food is in the middle of a life and death drama. As William Inge says, it's in the middle of a life and death drama. The whole of nature, the whole of nature is a conjunction of the verb to eat. Don't, we're almost done, all right? And you get, get you know, just give me about five more minutes. Can I get five more minutes? Yeah. All right. The whole of nature is a conjunction of the verb to eat, in the active and in the passive. Though eating is a gift and a grace, it is important to remember that eating comes at a great cost. 
As every gardener will tell us, healthy and fertile growth can only arise out of the soil into which death regularly enters. Every act of eating raises an important sobering question. But here's a question for you. How does any one of us become worthy of another's life and death? How does anyone become worthy of another's life and death? Israelite farmers and shepherds are bringing healthy animals and first fruits to offer up to God, not just leftovers, for atonement and connection with God. Thus, our sacrifice has to be the best. Do you get that? Our sacrifice has to be the best. And God in turn, who expects us to give our best, when it comes to saving us, This is where my world got rocked. When it comes to saving us, God looked around for the best and realized that it was Him. It blew my mind. Couldn't send an angel. Couldn't send a man. Couldn't send a prophet. Just let that sit in your soul for a second. I know I asked for five minutes, but give me eight minutes. Just let that sit in your soul for a while. Jesus incarnate. The express image of God. You can't make this up. And so Jesus in John chapter 6 is saying, hey, 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 the bread came down. Not just any type of bread, but the best. James says, hey, man, you know, you, you, you parents, you know, your kids ask you for gifts. You know, you, you, you know how to give good gifts. No one's going to say, you know, I want, I, I want, you know, a fish and you give him a stone or something. You give good gifts. Why do you think that God, your father, is not going to give you the best? The man came down, not a man, God came down in the form of the incarnate Christ to die for you and me because he's always about the best. And that came through not a parade or some big religious pious experience. That came through food. All in the Old Testament, food there, food there, raining tacos, all those things. And they remembered, man, this guy is talking about himself. He is the bread of life. He is the sustainer of life. So every time you come to the table on a Sunday, this thing about, well, I'm just, you know, in myself, doing it for myself. No, you are not doing it for yourself or by yourself. You are with other brothers and sisters. And when you eat and drink, you Consider them to do it in a worthy manner. Oh, it's my private time. No, it's not the private time. It's a communion. And we consider ourselves as we eat. And that fleshes out in very tangible, concrete, real ways. Let me land the plane. Or the bakery. Or the restaurant. A healthy agricultural system and a just food system. I think we all want. But these things are long shots in a broken world. Let me say it again. You want a healthy agricultural system and a just food system where land is not manipulated and wasted and people are not exploited. That is a long shot. How do you chop down the forest of such unawareness of food by chopping down one tree at a time, one concept at a time, preparing one meal at a time. 
You can plan a good meal physically and spiritually and invite ones that need to be fed. We bring Christ's presence to the table, sharing communion, his body and his blood, the life and sustenance. And when Christ says, hey, this I will do new with you in the kingdom, every time we have the supper, we feed on Christ. Ooh. That's what they thought in the back in the old days. No, we feed on Christ spiritually. So he says, I'm the bread of life. My blood is the life force. And every single time we have communion, we feed on Christ, which says, like the people in John 6, they got all they wanted. And then they said, hey, um, always give us this bread. If you are filled with Christ, then it plays out in your relationships and in your table. All this abundance, and some are still hungry, even in churches. And they've been in churches all their life. Paul says, that's why some are weak, and that's why some are sick. You don't get it spiritually, and I can tell because of the way you desecrate the fellowship meal by physically alienating people from good food. So the fruits of the tree will tell what the tree is. So what's the best food? Best food is the bread of life. If we eat Communion in isolation and alienation of others. I suspect that we can do it with our own food. Eating in isolation and alienation of our environment and community every single day. This is food for thought. You're not just eating to survive. You're not just eating because that's a mundane activity people do every single day. You have a grand opportunity to rethink food. Rethinking food is rethinking your environment. Rethinking food is rethinking the communion. Rethinking the communion is to be really fed on the body and blood of Christ spiritually. And really being fed is not to be weak and not to be sick and not to be falling asleep, but to be strong and to be healthy and to be alive, not just in a building, but outside. If you are fed, we will invite others to table as well who need to be fed. Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body on a mountainside. He said, take, eat, this is my body in the upper room. And every Sunday he's here, take, eat. Some people are not hungry. They're just not hungry. And uh, as you can tell, I've always been a hungry kid. The best food is food provided by God. The best food is Christ. As we stand and as we get ready to sing, I want to make the avenue of prayer open, as always. And if you have any concerns, if you have any need to walk in the strength, be supported by the strength of this congregation, then you can always come. But I am truly wrestling with this one. I'm truly wrestling with this one because at times I don't want to share on the table. At times I don't want to be open to community. At times I don't even know if I'm hungering and thirsting for the right things. But John 6 is convicting. And it's telling me that I need to cultivate a hunger and thirst for my Lord. And when you do that, there's no going back. 
When you do that, there is no going back. You don't get to stand up on a pulpit, which I think we give too much power to. This pulpit here is not for grandizement or to show anybody or to just state things abstract. It's for encouragement. And whenever you commit to feeding on that bread, you cannot turn back. And so it's not just about speaking your truth and saying, well, the church believes this. All right, the church believes this. What are you going to do about it? On a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, where real people struggle to meet and see Christ every day. We are shouting, truth, truth. And they over here shouting, proof. Proof. Not to sound cliche. The proof is in the pudding, but more in the bread and the wine. Sing. Faithful love flowing down from the Lord covered crown makes me almost as my soul washes in fire and snow. Faithful love comes each year, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can stand on my own. Faithful love. Thank you, Robbie. Amen. Um, our brother, Jay Appleton, just comes this morning. And if, if you know Jay, if you're in class with Jay, if you want to know Jay, I want you to come down right now and I want you to surround him because our brother needs you right now. Our brother needs your help. He needs to know. He needs to feel support. He needs the love from this congregation. He needs your prayers. He desperately desires all these things. He is a good guy. And uh, he come in this morning struggling. He's struggling with feeling worthy. How many of us have ever struggled with that? Yeah, me too. Feels like he's disappointing to God. He's struggling with depression. Jay needs our prayers. He needs our help. He needs our love. He needs our attention. He needs us right now. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Jay coming this morning and talking with me and um, spending some time, dear God. And I just pray for him now that you would hold him up 
that you would comfort him, that you would protect him from the evil one, that you would help him with his thoughts, that you would help him to not feel isolated and to hold things in, dear God, but to share and to share his story because he has such a great story. He's such a great guy, and he loves you desperately. Just help him, dear God, to feel those things, to feel that peace, that joy. Help those of us that surround him, dear God, that we will be an encouragement, that we will inspire him, that we will uh, offer our, our time and our, our love to him, dear God. We all struggle. We all struggle on a daily basis, and, and this, is, this is nothing new. This is nothing different from a bunch of us here. So we just pray that he knows that and that he feels that love and kindness, dear God. Thank you for sending Jesus to save us, the bread of life, dear God. In his name we pray, amen. This is why we are a family. We don't do this by ourselves. We do this together. Let's stand and read. Read with me, please. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 